This is Dr. Rebecca Simon, historian of piracy, colonial America, the Atlantic world, maritime history, and all-round pirate expert. Today, she's joining us to break down one of the all-time great pirate video games, Assassin's Creed Black Flag. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and share your thoughts in the comments below. You can find more on Rebecca in the description, including her socials, as well as to buy her books, including her latest release, The Pirate's Code, Laws and Life Aboard Ship. Without further ado, it's over to Dr. Simon. So this looks like it's really typical of a pirate battle. What's interesting is that it's happening during a storm. Ideally, sailors are going to try to avoid doing anything in a massive storm, but if you're far away from land, then it can't be helped. You also can't predict when you're going to be attacked by a ship or when you have a good opportunity coming in, but it's going to make it a lot interesting for the game to do a really big battle amongst this lightning storm. So it's interesting that during this battle, we see flames going up, which means what's happened is that some spark has gone off near the gunpowder. But what I find kind of interesting about this is that it, this is all happening during a storm. And unless everything is sealed really, really well on the top deck, once gunpowder gets wet, it becomes effectively useless. So it's actually quite unlikely that a big explosion like this is going to happen during a storm. This very much would happen during a battle if the weather was good. Not so much in this rainstorm, but it adds a lot more fun and flair to the game. Privateering, is it dangerous? Wouldn't pay so nice if it weren't. Why not sail with the King's Navy? Earn a proper wage, sail under gentlemen. Sod the Navy's gentlemen. For every shilling I'd earn, the captain gets 600. That's no way to earn a fortune. We don't need a fortune. So a privateer is similar to a pirate in that they basically are going and they are attacking and plundering ships. But the difference between a privateer and a pirate is that a privateer is working for the government. They are basically kind of hired mercenaries, almost freelancers of the sea. And the way they get paid is by being able to keep about 80% of all the loot they can steal from the attack ship. And the other 20% will go back to the government, whoever hired them. What he's saying about the Royal Navy, how for every shilling he makes, the captain gets six. This was a big criticism about people who sailed in the Royal Navy. And this had to do with the unfair wages. Uh, people were not paid equally for the most part. And sometimes wage hoarding was a reality. So a lot of people actually did enjoy becoming a privateer because they were guaranteed to get a lot more money, they had a lot more freedom. And the shares, which are basically the goods or the value of the goods being distributed amongst the different sailors, were pretty much always going to be pretty equal. How long would you be gone with these privateers? A year, I reckon. Two at the most. It's actually pretty standard. The average privateer sailed for about one to two years. Mad to think Spain and England were at war two years ago, isn't it? Here I am bartering with Spaniards like they were my cousins. Something wrong, Duncan? No, it's nothing. Sand in my hampers. Okay, so the war they're referring to is the War of Spanish Succession, which started around 1701-ish and lasted until about 1713, which makes sense for the game, having which takes place in 1715. The Spanish king died and he had no son. And it was a French relative who claimed he was next in line. And half of Europe did not want France to now become the most powerful country in Europe. Much of it took place on land, but a very significant amount took place on sea. Many of the most famous pirates to come out of this time period were originally privateers. They were veterans uh, of the Spanish, uh, the war of Spanish succession. So what he's looking at are two skeletons of pirates in a gibbet. A gibbet are these hanging cages, and you can see that they are shaped in order to accommodate a person. This was a very common punishment for pirates after they were hanged, which was the general punishment for all pirates. Their body would be tarred, so it would not decay. And on average, a pirate was strung up in a gibbet, a gibbet for three tides. And this was to kind of show, the, uh, this was to symbolize the scene of the crime. And 
also to kind of symbolize sailors drowning as well. But as you can see, they're two skeletons. So this is pretty uncommon, but there was a pirate named Captain Kidd who was strung up in a gibbet in 1701. His body was strung up for decades. And so he was one of the few pirates who actually did disintegrate into a skeleton. So this makes for something very dramatic in the game. A fun aside, the sign says pirates beware. You might notice that pirates is spelled with a Y. There wasn't any standardized spelling back then. I've seen the words pirates spelled in so many different ways in my research. P-I-R-A-T, P-Y-R-A-T, and as we see it, P-I-R-A-T-E-S. So yeah, so not a typo, um, not artistic for the game, very accurate of the time. No one would stand for that, someone climbing the walls of the church especially in the Catholic run country. We really did the research of what a Caribbean city would look like during the time period. By Jove, you're alive! Of course I am. That felt was no fuss. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ah, we've arrived. Steve Bonnet was a pirate. He was known as the Gentleman Pirate. He was born actually in Barbados. He was a plantation owner. The way he became a pirate was that he kind of had a midlife crisis basically, and he got bored and decided to buy a ship, hire a crew, and then they set off sailing as pirates. What's also interesting is that he actually paid pirates a wage, which is unheard of of other pirates. Pirates were always paid in the goods that they could steal. They're on a Spanish ship to Sevilla, one of the quote unquote treasure fleets. The treasure fleets was a huge fleet of Spanish ships that were sailing from their, their American colonies, mostly in modern day Mexico, Central America. And they had tons of gold. Like you just saw a pile in a corner. The gold would have been sealed up, but you know, you want to see it in the game, of course. But what happened is that in 1715, the Spanish treasure fleet is going to sail to Spain, but what happens is they're actually going to hit a hurricane and they're going to crash off the coast of Florida. And for decades, over a hundred years, the gold kept washing up onto Florida shore. And this is actually how cities in Florida, such as St. Augustine, managed to become very wealthy. So he's basically, he's on a doomed ship that will never reach Spain. Aye, there's a brig in this fleet. I'll make my way to it. So obviously for a game, you're just going to see a few people on the deck because you want to stab and kill each one of them. In reality, a ship like this, a ship of this size, is going to be crawling with sailors all across the deck because you need people working absolutely everything, especially in the rain. Now, in terms of two people wanting to essentially take over this ship, it would take a massive pirate ship to be able to take on a Spanish galleon. <laughs> He's just killed the captain of a ship. Pirates, when they captured a ship or when they want to take over a ship, they were actually quite orderly with the captain and the quartermaster, the two people in charge. And this is because pirates wanted to get in and out as quick, quick as possible. They actually oftentimes didn't kill very many people and they would negotiate with the captain in order to get the goods that they wanted. And so that way everyone could get off scot-free very, very quickly. It was pretty rare for a pirate to go ahead and kill a captain. This is guaranteed that they're going to go ahead and get captured later on, pretty much. Every pirate's dream to be able to take a Spanish galleon. Hardly any ever did that. I don't know of any actually. There are reports that of the, the entire Spanish treasure fleet that crashed off the coast of Florida in the storm, there's one ship that managed to get away. So it looks like perhaps the game is trying to answer this mystery as to what that ship was by giving it to Edward. So that's a really cool piece of historical detail that they're throwing into here. So good for Edward getting that one escape ship. Adi, these lads are the better part of our growing confederacy here. Ed Thatch, Ben Hornigold, James Kidd. Benjamin Hornigold was a captain in the War of Spanish Succession, and 
he's the one who actually would turn Nassau into what became known as the pirate kingdom. And this was a bit facetious. Basically what he did is he went into Nassau, which was kind of a haven for prostitutes and sailors. And of course, pirates, very lawless. There was no real organization. He comes in and sort of shakes things up, makes it organized, establishes law and order, and also makes it a place where pirates can come and offload their goods very safely. And this happens around 1713 at the very end of the war. So Edward Teach is commonly known as Blackbeard. He's actually Hornigold's protege. He sailed under Hornigold as a quartermaster. Not a bad take today. Keep this up and Nassau will be the first city where men and women may live as God made them. Easy and free. All it takes is a few drops of blood, sweat, and a swatch of cloth. We fly no colors out here, but praise the lack of them. So let the black flag signal nothing but your allegiance to man's natural freedoms. So the black flag, this is the Jolly Roger as we know it. This is the pirate flag. And the pirate flag has actually been in use since about the 1600s. And there actually used to be two colors. There used to be a red flag and there used to be a black flag. And the red flag signaled that we will give no quarter, meaning we're not going to give mercy. We are attacking and fighting to the death. We will not negotiate. A black flag that a pirate might fly meant that we would give quarter. We will negotiate, we will give mercy, if you decide to surrender. And then over time, around the turn of the 18th century, especially going into the war of Spanish succession, the red flag sort of lost popularity until it just became a black flag altogether. And it became very synonymous with pirates. They often would decorate their own flag. They would create their own design. The pirate Bartholomew Roberts, basically his flag had a picture of a self-portrait. On the flag we just saw, it had a skull. And the skull and crossbones was a very popular image to use. So this is the new Libertalia, eh? Stinks the same as every other squat I've robbed this past year. He's saying this is the new Libertalia, eh? And what he's referencing is a mythical pirate kingdom that was said to be in Madagascar off the east coast of Africa, which had been a pirate haven in the late 1600s for a lot of British pirates who had been sailing in the Red Sea and Indian Ocean, such as Henry Avery and also Captain Kidd. Libertalia actually didn't exist, but it's become a huge part of maritime and pirate lore. So he's comparing Nassau to this new Libertalia. Nassau is a pirate haven now. It's where all kinds of degenerates of the sea and just in general go. Fact of the matter is the British did not pay much attention to the Bahamas. The Bahamas was not a producing colony, a series of islands. This is actually why pirates became attracted to the region. It's right in the middle of a lot of sea lanes being across off the coast of Florida. So they're able to capture lots of ships. They've got good proximity to North America and the Caribbean. So it's a great location. And luckily for them, the Royal Navy, the British aren't really paying attention to it. So it's the perfect spot. If your quarry something to fear, some hellish thing, from a fever dream, and men will drop to their knees, pleading for their lord before all else. <sighs> we see Steve Bonnet again, and Blackbeard is yelling at him quite significantly. Steve Bonnet is a horrible pirate. He has no sailing skills. The idea that he purchased a ship rather than stole a ship automatically makes him seem illegitimate as a pirate. Blackbeard had no respect for him. All he wanted was just simply Steve Bonnet's money. And he really hated how incompetent Bonnet was to the point where Blackbeard actually ends up abandoning him and betraying him to the authorities in North Carolina in 1717. Also, just a quick note, you can see that the sparklers are coming off of Blackbeard's face. So this is very accurate. The most famous images we have of Blackbeard from the 1700s is an image of him with these smoking sparklers coming out of his hair. And he did this on purpose in order to frighten people, to get them to surrender, to make himself look like he was a man who had come just out of hell. So that's another great historical detail. I found one crate hidden beneath a school of sharks. Sadly, the elixir inside is... Quite spoiled. Plagan. Blackbeard is really famous for blockading the port of Charleston, South Carolina, and this is because he wants the medicine, because him and several of his crew are just addled with syphilis. So, fun little thing that they shoved in there. I'm not a man accustomed to murder, Captain. But if you're taking quarter, you 
not be sleeping now. Suck a muscle, gobshite. He was known to be extremely frightening, but he wasn't actually someone who murdered people. Most pirates weren't actually as violent as we think. Blackbeard never killed anybody during his tenure as a pirate until his very final battle. So we do see Blackbeard get shot, and uh, according to eyewitness reports, he's then stabbed in the leg, and when this happens, he yells, well done, lad. And then one of the other people attacking, who was a Scottish Highlander, actually came up behind Blackbeard and beheads him. So I'm really pleased with this clip because I've seen a few portrayals of Blackbeard, and never once have I ever seen it accurately portrayed. Lost your man again, did you? Aye. Roberts is a devil with a queer aversion to kindness. I suppose that's two men I've lost today. So, what's your real name, lass? Mary Reed to my mum. And them I call friends. But not a word of it to anyone. Or I'll unman you as well. Let's talk about Mary Reed for a minute. She is very real pirate. There is no evidence that she was someone who disguised herself as a man. All reports of victims who were captured and put as hostages by Jack Rackham and Bonnie and Mary Reed all said that she did wear women's clothing during battle. Oh, oh, dear lady, what do they call you? And when oh. they're sober, a jilt when they're sauced. But never, lady. <laughs> well, good Leanne. I, I, oh, oh, oh. This is undoubtedly Anne Bonny. She ran off with a sailor named James Bonny, who actually did sail on a pirate ship. And then the two of them came to the Bahamas and they stopped in Nassau. In the meantime, she and Bonny actually ended up separating because, bon uh, because James Bonny decided to become a pirate hunter. She loved being a pirate and she loved pirates and found this to be a betrayal. So she was known to kind of frequent the taverns, becoming friends with pirates, getting lots of information, and also known to have affairs with pirates. Uh, as far as I know, she was never a barmaid, but it kind of gives her a bit more of a background to be used in the game. His Majesty's Court contends that the defendants, Mary Reed and Anne Bonny, did piratically, feloniously, and in an hostile manner, attack, engage, and take seven certain fishing boats. That's exact word for word from the trial transcript. So great detail with Assassin's Creed. We're pregnant! Do you all hear that? What the devil did you say? They plead their bellies, my lord. Aye, you can't hang a woman quick with child, can ye? Because they were pregnant, they were given what is known as a stay of execution, meaning they're going to delay their execution until they give birth to their children. In actuality, 90, about 95% of all women who were given a death sentence actually were not executed. Mary, it's me, Edward. Edward? Who's this fella? It's all right, Anne. He's a friend. What's wrong with Mary? She's ill. And her child? They took her. No idea where. Oh! 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 I know it pains, my lady, but we must be silent. Can you walk? <gasps> Mary Reed is sick, and what's tragic is that she does die in prison in April of 1721. And it was reported that she died of something called jail fever, which is today we will call typhus, which you, is a bacterial infection that you get from lice. We do not know what happened to her child. It's very possible she also died from complications in childbirth or perhaps complications with her pregnancy. and is clearly no longer in prison. So in real life, we actually don't really know what happened to her. There's no record of her being hanged, and so there's no record of her having died in prison either. For a very long time, it was believed by historians that most likely her father basically paid her to get out of jail, brought her back home. She married and she ha possibly had her child there and lived until about 1782. This was kind of the accepted historical narrative, but actually about two years ago, a YouTuber uh, found a record from St. Catherine's Parish, which was in Jamaica, of a death record in 1731 listing a woman named Anne Bonny. 
So now it's very possible that it's believed that she lived out the, uh, the next 10 years of her life in Jamaica. But again, beyond that, we don't actually know what happened. Pirates all had origins for the most part as sailors. So they actually did not dress any different than the standard sailor of the time. He is wearing what looks like quite the hefty outfit here. In a way, this outfit is practical in that it blocks his body from the elements. He's also going to get overheated very quickly. He will get heat stroke within minutes in the Caribbean. Sailors generally wore very light clothing. They would wear cotton shirts or linen shirts and same with trousers. Um, the, the material had to be sturdy though. So um, what they would often do is they would coat their clothing in tar. And what this did is it allowed their clothing to actually be a lot more durable in that it was less likely to rip, but even more importantly, it was less likely to let in the sun rays through the clothing and it would help protect their skin. So he's wearing leather boots. That is actually very accurate. But most of the time when they were just generally working on the ship, they would often be barefoot. Um, and this is because, you know, you could use your toes to grip on things, especially if you're having to climb the mass and everything like that. Shoes were also very much a prized commodity. You never had really had more than one pair, so you only wore them sparingly. So they would be worn in battle or once they were on land. And again, they were often this leather material to protect themselves against the elements, protect their clothing, protect their skin. So this is very accurate. This is more accurate of a pirate captain. Pirate captains did dress this way for the most part, believe it or not. They needed a way to distinguish themselves on the ship. If you take a look at the material, it's not leather. It's a lot more breathable. Now, of course, he's got all the weapons on him, which of course you're going to need in Assassin's Creed, but a captain wouldn't be holding those in general. He might just have a cutlass at his side. Also, you might note that he has tattoos on his chest. They often did this so that way they could be identified in case they died. A pirate attack isn't going to start so violently right away. It's actually quite methodical. In terms of ships firing cannons at each other, that's not going to happen right away for the most part, because what we need to understand is that, well, yes, you're going to damage the other ship. Well, they're going to damage you too. And you don't want to be damaging your own ship. You don't want to be losing your own crew members. This is why pirates would do everything they can actually to avoid violence like this. They wanted to get in, steal goods and get out as fast as they can. In terms of when you are firing cannons, this is very accurate. You saw him really quickly reach into his little satchel and pull out a little device and tearing it open with his teeth. That's the gunpowder. And we see him reload his gun really quickly. And in actuality, an experienced pirate fighter would be able to do it that quickly before being set upon. You had to because it was life or death. So that's a really excellent detail that they've used here in the game. What I want to point out here are um, is this short noose um, you can see on the right hand side. Oftentimes when pirates were executed, they were given a short noose. And the idea is when the scaffold was opened below them, and they would drop, their neck wouldn't break because the noose, the rope was so short. And instead they would strangle to death and their bodies would jerk around. And this was known as the marshal's dance. And so sometimes it could take like up to an hour. Is there will drink and sorrow down. Good morning, ladies all. Singing was a huge pastime, not just on pirate ships, but all sailing ships in general. There's lots of songs. They're often based very much on maritime lore and other stories, perhaps victories. They all have a very similar tune. It's easy to memorize the lyrics because of this. Watch it, love and bell! The rope is holding! They're harpooning a killer whale. Now, at this time, whaling wasn't really popular yet. That would come more in the later 18th century, the later 1700s. You have to have a very specific ship for it. You need to have specific weapons. They do have a harpoon here, but it's very, whaling is extremely dangerous and they can destroy a ship in seconds. So general pirate ship during this time, they're not really going to be equipped for it because again, whaling is not common yet during in this region of the world. But again, it's a fun, it's going to be 
kind of a fun exercise here in the game. Assassin's Creed is extremely detailed in everything that they've done in this game. I know it was researched very, very well. They're getting a lot of major pirate mythology into the game, um, including kind of what we know within pop culture. As an expert in piracy, I would wholeheartedly recommend this game to absolutely anybody if they wanted to learn about pirate culture, because for the most part, it's done very well. It's extremely accurate. So I'm very impressed by it. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to comment below for what other games you'd like to see on the show and be sure to subscribe for more content like this and beyond.